Hi, I'm Andre and I'm going to present our paper Syndrome Decoding Estimator, which is joint work with Emanuele Bellini. The NIST standardization effort for post-quantum secure cryptographic schemes is approaching the end of the third round. And as we know, this round will end with the selection of schemes to be standardized which makes it an increasingly important task to understand the exact security guarantees given by the proposed parameter sets. Since we want to standardize the most efficient, meaning the smallest parameter sets that actually achieve the desired security levels. In this talk, we focus on code-based schemes. There are still three remaining in the third round. That is Classic McAleese as one of the finalists and bike and HQC on the alternate list. So the goal of this work is to establish precise security estimates uh, for the parameter sets of these schemes under different metrics, where these metrics uh, especially target different memory models. So code-based schemes are usually based on the hardness of the syndrome decoding problem, which we define in a minute. And the best known algorithms to attack this problem are information set decoding algorithms. And the landscape of information set decoding algorithms is quite diverse, meaning there are a lot of different algorithms of this class. And this makes it a difficult task to estimate uh, precisely the complexity of each of these all algorithms to then find the minimum of all these estimates to finally uh, derive the security guarantee of a proposed parameter set. So in this work, we observe relations between all major ISD improvements, which allows us to unify them in a kind of framework. So we find that all of them are internally solving some kind of nearest neighbor routine or nearest neighbor problem. And their biggest difference is how they solve this problem. So by substituting the routine used to solve this problem, we obtain different, uh, the different formulas, the different estimates for the complexities of these algorithms. And we provide these, uh, these formulas in a tool called Synonym Decoding Estimator, uh, written in Python, which allows to estimate the hardness of arbitrary instances. And using this uh, tool, then we uh, obtain precise security estimates for the different schemes. The talk is structured as follows. In the first half, we will investigate this framework and see how the different ISD algorithms fit into this. And in the second half, we will then talk about the different memory models and the precise or concrete security estimates. So let us start with the definition of the syndrome decoding problem. So for the syndrome decoding problem, we're given the parity check matrix of a code. It's n minus k times n matrix and a syndrome S, a vector of length n minus k, and um, uh, integer omega. So everything is binary here. We are working in F2, and we are asked to find an error vector E of length n, which fulfills the identity H times E is equal to S, and has a Hamming weight of omega, so meaning it has exactly omega coordinates equal to 1. So visually, we will represent this as follows h times e is equal to s and note that e is basically a selection of columns of h that sums to s. Before now uh, diving into the details of the different ISD algorithms, let us make some basic observations. So we can permute an instance by main, uh, and still maintain this uh, identity here. So this means we can permute the columns of the parity check matrix as long as we apply a similar permutation to the error vector. So this basically models the fact that we can multiply the parity check matrix by a permutation matrix from the right as long as we multiply the error vector by the inverse permutation from the left. And this allows us to redistribute the weight of, um, the, weight of the error on the full coordinates. So we can achieve a random weight distribution on E. So now we have here our permuted instance and we can apply a, another transformation by still maintaining the identity. That is, we can multiply both sides with an invertible matrix. And we can try craft this matrix such that we diagonalize the left part 
the left uh, n minus k times n minus k uh, submatrix of the parity check matrix. And uh, of course, this changes the syndrome, but uh, we maintain the identity. And as I said, the permutation allows to redistribute the weight on the error. So in the following, we will assume that this permutation distributes the weight such that, such that we have a weight omega minus p on the first uh, part of the error and weight p on the second part, where p is an optimization parameter of the algorithm. And we can write this identity as h prime times e2 is equal to s prime plus e1. And note that the error weight in general is small compared to the length of the vector. So, so E is a, is a small weight vector, meaning that uh, this identity here is, we, we can somehow define an approximate identity between H prime times E2 and S prime, approximate in the sense that it is it holds up to the addition of E1, but E1 is small or of low hemming weight. And ISD algorithms then work in a quite similar fashion. Uh, so all the algorithms work in a quite similar fashion. They first permute the instance to redistribute the error weight, hoping for weight P on E2. Then they apply the Gaussian elimination to diagonalize the left part of the matrix. And finally, they try to solve this almost identity. Uh, so finding an E2 such that H prime times E2 is uh, close to S prime. And note that the optimization parameter P allows to shift either more or less work into this third step. So, by, so for example, for P equal to zero, this third step becomes trivial because there's only one possibility to, uh, to check. But uh, the higher P gets, the more costly the search for E2 becomes. But on the other hand, the more uh, weight we shift into E2, the uh, more likely it becomes that we permute the error weight as desired. So should the third step not uh, result in a solution, the algorithm starts over with step one, so a new permutation, because uh, it, uh, the permutation did not distribute weight P on E2. Now let us look into different ISD algorithms and how they approach this third step. So here we will skip the original ISD algorithm by Pranger, which basically chooses p equal to zero and dive directly into the improvements made by Stern and Dumer. So here we have the identity h prime times e2 equal to s prime plus e1 visualized and both algorithms, the one by Stern and the one by Dumer, start by splitting e2 in a meet in the middle fashion. So they split e2 into vectors where the first one has weight only on the first half and the second one only on the second half. Together they form a vector of weight p. And now we uh, label both parts of the vectors with x and y accordingly. And then by splitting the matrix in the same fashion, we can move the dependence of x and y on different sides of the equation. And this allows us then to create two lists, one containing h1 times x for all possible choices of x, and another list of uh, containing h2 times y plus s prime for all possible choices of y. And now we can find e2 by finding actually e1 close pairs between those lists. And this means uh, we are basically interested in finding close pairs between those lists, which are nearest neighbor, which is the nearest neighbor problem. So now both algorithms do not solve the nearest neighbor problem directly on all coordinates. They work on a projection of coordinates. So, for example, let us take the last L coordinates of, of the vectors and then try to solve the nearest neighbor problem on these coordinates and finally checking if for the found solutions the, they are short on, on overall on all coordinates. So the algorithm by Stern now simply assumes that for the chosen projection, the weight of E1 is zero, so E1 is zero on the chosen projection. This then allows to perform a simple search for equality on this projection between both lists. And uh, for all matching pairs, it then checks if uh, the sum is short on the remaining coordinates. And of course, we, we do not know if this uh, 
if the projection of E1 is zero. So we have to repeat this uh, procedure for several projections until we might assume that uh, one of them does for one of them it holds that uh, E1, the weight of E1 is zero. And some of you might have noticed that this procedure of finding uh, near elements between two lists by projecting them to random coordinates and searching for equality on these coordinates is actually known as a procedure called indic modvani locality-sensitive hashing. So Stern's algorithm is solving this nearest neighbor problem by using indic modvani nearest neighbor search. So now Dumer's algorithm differentiates in the way it solves this problem. So it does not no longer assume that uh, E1 is zero on this projection, but it has some weight on this projection. And of course, we cannot search for equality anymore because the identity now depends on E1 again, and uh, we did not account for this. Now the algorithm splits the weight on the projection of E1 again in a meet in the middle fashion, similar to how we split E2 in X and Y, and moves one of these parts to the other side of the equation. This then allows to not only perform a meet in the middle on E2, but also on the difference. Meaning we do not only enumerate X in the list, but X and the difference and Y and the difference respectively. And this of course increases the lists, but uh, we also can search for equality on this projection again. So this is basically a meet in the middle algorithm for solving nearest neighbor, the nearest neighbor problem, which is how Dumer solves this nearest neighbor problem. Next, let us investigate how most recent ISD improvements work and how they employ nearest neighbor search. So most recent ISD improvements usually split E2 not only in two, but in four or even more add-ins. And we find that for the cryptographic setting, four add-ins is almost, so splitting into four add-ins is almost always optimal. So let us stay with four for the moment. And then the algorithm again, similar to the algorithms by uh, Stern and Dumer, uh, create multiple lists here containing H prime times XI and adding the S prime to the last list so that they are now need, uh, or they are now searching for one element from each list which uh, so, such that they sum together to something that is small. And they find these elements by combining two lists at a time. And first again on a projection, searching for some vectors uh, which are close uh, or add up to something small. And then in a final step, they search for vectors that are small on the, the other coordinates. And as they were already small on the projection, they will add up to something that stays somehow small. And of course, to create those lists, the algorithms need to uh, employ uh, nearest neighbor search algorithms again. And we find that by uh, using the kind of meet in the middle technique to solve this nearest neighbor, uh, sub, this neighbor's nearest neighbor problems, we obtain variants of the improvements known as MMT and BJMM, named after the inventors Mai Moira and Tomer and Becca Ju Mai Moira. And now by substituting these um, the, the subroutines for nearest neighbor search, we obtain different ISD algorithms. For example, by uh, if we exchange the meet in the middle strategy on the last level by uh, a nearest neighbor technique by Mai and Otsorov, we obtain an ISD algorithm similarly known as my Otsorov ISD algorithm. Unfortunately, the nearest neighbor search technique by Maya and Otsorov is not very practical, so it inherits huge polynomial overheads, such that in our practical considerations, we exchanged it by the Indic Modvani um, procedure, which gives the first uh, practical variant of the my Otsorov algorithm. And now by exchanging the subroutines on both levels by the nearest neighbor search technique from Mai and Otsorov, we obtain an improvement made by both and Mai. Again, since Mai Otsorov uh, nearest neighbor search does not yield good practical complexities, we exchange it by the Indic Modvani variant. So this gives a simple framework to determine the practical complexity of different ISD algorithms.
Of course, the time complexity formula shown here is further simplified, but it boils down to the number of permutations needed to ensure the correct weight distribution times the time it takes to compute the diagonalization of the matrix plus the time for the tree computation. And the time for the tree computation is mainly dependent on the chosen nearest neighbor routines, which determine the time needed to construct the intermediate and the final list. Before we look into what this means for the security of the proposed parameter sets, let us investigate the cost of memory. Because all algorithms we've seen in this talk so far rely on some enumeration procedures which involve lists of large size. Here we see a timeline of uh, ISD improvements and when they originated. Uh, so please note that this is just a selection of improvements. There are plenty of others omitted here. And as uh, we said in the beginning, we uh, also omitted in our presentation the original algorithm by Prange and also an improvement by Lee and Brickell. So note that these ISD algorithms would actually only require a polynomial amount of memory. So they do not rely on enumeration procedures, but all algorithms we've seen use an exponential amount of memory. And as a rule of thumb, you can say if going from left to right, these algorithms use more and more memory. And the access to these amounts of memory will definitely slow down the computation of the algorithm. So the question is, how do we account for this in our security estimates? Where well, the conservative answer is probably we don't. But the more realistic answer is we, are, we introduce a time penalty. So an algorithm with time complexity t and memory complexity m is said to have cost t times f of m, where f is some penalty function. So for example, we obtain quite directly the conservative setting if we set uh, f of m to 1. So, or some other constant, which is why this setting is known as a constant access setting. There are other established uh, penalty functions, such as the logarithm, logarithm or the uh, cube root or even square root, which are then uh, known as the logarithmic, the cube root or the square root memory access setting. And we will investigate these three settings here, constant, logarithmic and cube root in our, uh, in our considerations. Now I said that the algorithms have an exponential amount of uh, memory usage, but this is only half the truth because it depends on the, on the weight omega. So exponential is the memory usage only if the error weight is a constant fraction of the code length, so of the length of the vector. But for cryptographic applications, this is usually not the case. So let us investigate how relevant the memory usage is for cryptographic sized parameters. Here we see the, the memory usage for the bike and HQC uh, setting, where, uh, which uses a very low error weight omega of just size square root of n. And uh, on the left we see the plot where we have on the x-axis the uh, code lengths ranging from basically zero to parameters offering about 250 to 300 bits of security. And on the y-axis we see the logarithm of their memory usage for the exemplary algorithms or by BGMM, Stern and Prange. We see that all algorithms for all parameters use a quite moderate amount of memory, so no memory, uh, so no algorithm actually exceeds the memory usage of 2 to the 45 bits of memory. So for bike and HQC, memory seems not to be the relevant factor. The picture changes a bit if we investigate the McAleese setting. For McAleese, we have an error weight which scales with n over log n, so it's uh, higher than in the bike and HQC setting. And uh, this uh, translates to the memory usage of these algorithms. We see for Prange still we have uh, very low memory usage, but for the improvements uh, which rely on enumeration, so for Stern and PJMM, we have a drastically increased uh, memory usage where Stern uses uh, roughly 2 to the 100 bits of memory and BJMM almost 2 to the 200 uh, bits of memory for parameters that offer about 250 to 300 bits of security. So for Ma the McAleese uh, parameters, besides the question if such amounts of memory will be ever available, the 
the access timings to these amounts of memory will certainly slow down the computations of the algorithm. Equipped with this knowledge, let us now investigate the security level of uh, the proposed parameter sets, again starting with Spike and HQC. NIST provides three categories, uh, security categories that relate their security to AES, meaning uh, set is uh, set to be secure uh, in category 1, 3 or 5 if it is at least as hard to break as the respective AES instantiation. And let us start with a conservative model, so this constant access setting where we do not account for the memory usage and we find that bike already matches uh, all security levels under this metric. And uh, here in the table we see the security margin that bike has over breaking AES, meaning in bike category 1 is 3 bits harder to break as AES128, for example. And the negative number would therefore correspond to a security deficit. Of course, if we now introduce memory access uh, costs, then we can only increase these security margins and the same holds for the HQC, uh, for the HQC scheme. Also here, HQC matches the security levels already under uh, the conservative, in the conservative model. So we recall that bike and HQC both use a very small value of omega. So for all instantiations we see here, the memory usage is quite low with only 2 to the 40 bits of memory. So a maximum of 2 to the 40 bits of memory. We see again for bike and HQC, memory is definitely not the most relevant factor. Let us next investigate the McAleese, the classic McAleese uh, parameters. So the same categories hold for the McAleese scheme. The only difference is that the McAleese team provides three parameter sets for the category 5, 5A and 5B uh, parameter sets roughly giving the same security and category 5C set meant to provide very high security guarantees. Starting with the con constant access model, we find that only category 1 and the category 5C set are matching their security levels. But to be fair, this is known to the McAleese team and they say that the algorithms used to obtain these security estimates use high amounts of memory and the access timings to these amounts of memory will make up for the difference. And they are somehow right. These algorithms use a high amount of memory, which ranges from 2 to the 90 to 2 to the 200 bits of memory. And as I already said, the bare existence of these amounts of memory are already questionable. So before looking into memory access timing or ex memory access costs, let us uh, investigate how the complexity behaves if we limit the memory. So if we employ some memory bounds. So remember that the algorithm has have this optimi optimization parameter P which allows them to shift more or less weight into the enumeration part and by decreasing this value of P they shift less weight into the enumeration part which allows them actually to consume less memory. And we see that we decrease the deficits a little bit and uh, we increase the margins but overall the, um, the, the, the picture stays the same. The same we observe if we impose logarithmic memory access costs. So here uh, the algorithms are penalized by the logarithm of their memory usage, but they still have the same memory usage as in the constant access setting depicted by the same color here. Uh, so the, the, the memory usage, is, uh, the memory cost is actually too low to make the optimization uh, choose a different strategy. If we then go to the cube root access setting, we see that the picture changes drastically. So that here the memory access cost is so high that uh, the algorithm's optimization actually tries to avoid the use of memory. Meaning uh, we see that uh, the memory here ranges only, the memory consumption ranges only from 2 to the 25 to 2 to the 47 bits of memory. And most of the parameter sets are then able to match their, uh, their security uh, levels, e even if uh, not equally well. 
and the category 3 set seems to be somewhat an outlier here which is not able to match uh, the security level under any of the employed metrics. So what does this mean for the code-based cryptographic schemes? For bike and HQC, we have seen that they match their security levels already under conservative metrics, meaning in the constant access model, where we do not impose uh, memory access costs, which is the result of the very low over error weight they are using. And as a rule of thumb, one can say that the more or the higher the error weight becomes, the more memory these algorithms use, and hence the more relevant it becomes or the more necessary also to precisely model the memory access costs. We've seen this especially for the McAleese submission, but also for the bike and HQC team, we suggest to decide for metrics under which the parameters should be proposed and then to ensure that all proposed parameter sets match the security levels equally well. So our paper is online. Thank you very much. And for details, please give it a look.